Hi, it's Conrad Fisher, and here's our next section, Hematology. I'm the Associate Professor of Medicine at Truro College of Medicine and the Director of Educational Development for the Jamaica Hospital System. Welcome to HEM. This first section of Hematology is Anemia. We're going to look at the presentation, diagnostic tests, symptoms, and most importantly, start the largest collection of individual tests where they have only one disease for each of these tests. We're going to look at them based on cell size. Is it micro? Is it macro? Is it normocytic? Normal cell size, and what's the treatment? All forms of anemia present with identical symptoms if they have the same hematocrit. You see, it's not the etiology, it's based on the severity. It's not the etiology, it's based on the severity. The symptoms are based on the severity of the anemia, not the etiology of that anemia. So the answer to the question, what is the most likely diagnosis, simply cannot be answered based on the symptoms alone. You can't say you're fatigued, you must have iron deficiency, or you're really fatigued, you must have sideroblastic. It's not possible. You need diagnostic tests. And the best initial test to evaluate anemia is always the CBC, the complete blood count. The symptoms of anemia are entirely based on what is the hematocrit and what is the underlying condition of that patient. If you have a person who's generally healthy and has no underlying medical conditions, they will feel nothing at a hematocrit of 30 to 35, and they won't even feel hematocrit of 25 to 30. You would only start to feel a hematocrit of 25 and 30 if you were a person who had underlying heart and lung disease. If you have underlying heart and lung disease, you'll start to feel a little tired, a little fatigued, a little short of breath at 25 and 30. A generally healthy person won't start to feel a hematocrit until it gets down as low as 20. Now, a person who has underlying heart disease will actually have chest pain, lightheadedness. And at 20 or lower, you'll actually have syncope and chest pain. Remember, it's not the etiology that gives the symptoms, it's the severity. You feel nothing at hematocrits above 30 to 35, and everybody feels tired under 20 to 25. And if you have underlying heart and lung disease, you will have chest pain and syncope under a hematocrit of 20. Ultimately, cardiac ischemia from anemia proves fatal. And the myocytes just can't distinguish between anemia, hypoxia, coronary artery disease, or carbon monoxide poisoning. All of these conditions result in decreased oxygen delivery to tissues. In anemia, you don't have red cells to carry the oxygen. So how's the oxygen supposed to get to the heart? If you're hypoxic, there is no oxygen to deliver. If you have coronary disease, there's stenosis, and there's a simple blockage of the flow of blood. How can you deliver oxygen if you can't get the red cells there? And in carbon monoxide poisoning, you have cells that are fantastically fully saturated with oxygen, but they're simple simply not going to release it to the tissues. The hold on to that oxygen is like having a rich boyfriend that still makes you pay for dinner. Now the first clue to knowing the etiology is the cell size, that MCV, the mean corpuscular average cell size. If the MCV is low, it's a microcytosis, and the MCV is high, it's a macrocytosis. Now macro just means large cells above an MCV of 100. Doesn't mean megaloblastic. Megaloblastic means hypersegmented neutrophils. Macrocytosis is common. High cell size can be from alcohol and nutritional deficiencies, from folate and from various toxins on the bone marrow, liver disease, but hypersegmented things with megaloblastic. Now that's rare. The cause of microcytosis are indispensable few. All the microcytic anemias are iron deficiency, thalassemia, sideroblastic anemia, and chronic disease can be both microcytic and normocytic, but it fits in more easy to understand with microcytics because the reticulocyte count is low and there's no elevation in bilirubin. That's why the anemia of chronic disease is easier to understand with the microcytics. These are indispensable. Don't walk onto your test without knowing what causes microcytosis. Now, there is a lot of similarity amongst the microcytic anemias. For instance, all of them have a low reticulocyte count. So that's why we don't describe the anemias first based on reticulocyte count, because you can't tell which one you have based on reticulocytes. And most of the macrocytics have a low reticulocyte count as well. B12 and folate deficiency have a low reticulocyte count because the cells are just not made correctly. So whether it's iron deficiency, I can't make cells without iron, or anemia of chronic disease, if I'm overwhelmingly ill, if I have a chronic infection or cancer, I can't make cells, so no reticulocytes. Now, no reticulocytes are cells that are 
are the newer cells. They're the newborns, the neonates of cells. Only alpha thalassemia with three genes deleted elevates the reticulocyte side count, oh man. And that's because alpha thalassemia here, the cells are made, but they're very, very defective, like making a lot of extra cars that don't work. Now, this statement here about these three gene deleted people, this is a very rare disorder, but you know, we're not here just to pass our exam. We're here to excel. We are not here to pass, we're here to kick ass. Microcytic anemias are due to production problems. So therefore, that's why it's nearly synonymous with decreased reticulocyte counts. A routine blood smear, looking at those cells, simply is not effective in telling the difference between the different types of microcytosis. They're not. They are all hypochromic, and potentially they can all give target cells. Now, target cells may be most common with thalassemia, but they all could give target cells in hypochromic cells. We want to answer the questions. We want to be able to say, what do we need to know to answer the questions? Reticular site count smear is not going to do it. You start with microcytosis, then get on to the iron studies. High MCV anemias, large cells, macrocytosis, B12 and folate are both macrocytic and megaloblastic. Alcohol raises the cell size. Sideroblastic anemia can also raise the cell size. Liver disease or hypothyroidism can also raise cell size. Remember, sideroblastic with the extra iron built up in the mitochondria can be micro or macrocytic anemia. Medications like the AZT medication, Zidovudine, now called Zidovudine, AZT, the HIV medication, Zidovudine, phenytoin. Phenytoin also does it because phenytoin causes folate loss in the urine. So anti-metabolite medications like azathioprine, well, it's metabolite, 6 mecaptopurine. Remember, azathioprine is metabolized to 6-MP, and hydroxyurea can do it. And the myelodysplastic syndrome, these are all the causes of macrocytosis. Macrocytic anemias all, all have a low reticulocyte count because they're all a decrease in production. Normocytic anemias are two major things, acute blood loss and hemolysis. These are both a rapid drop in hematocrit, and there's no time for MCV changes. You see, you need days or weeks for MCV changes to happen. Now, you can have a slight increase in the MCV with hemolysis because reticulocyte counts are a little larger. So hemolysis can increase the reticulocyte count, and blood loss leads to iron deficiency and microcytosis chronically but it's acute blood loss, acute blood loss, that's normocytic. Over time, blood loss makes you iron deficient. Hemolysis increased the reticulocyte count and reticulocytes are larger. So if you go to a 10 or 15% reticulocyte count, it can raise the MCV a little bit. Reticulocytes are slightly larger. They're about an MCV of 120. So blood loss and hemolysis raise the reticulocyte count. The treatment of anemia, if it's severe, you're going to give packed red blood cells. Now, nobody gets whole blood anymore. Whole blood is always wrong. Now, answering the question, at what hematocrit do I transfuse, really depends on the nature of the patient. First of all, are they symptomatic? If they're symptomatic, it's easy. You can't let people walk around being short of breath and lightheaded. Anybody who's symptomatic needs to have the tank filled, period. Young, old, healthy, unhealthy. You can't breathe. You get lightheaded. You got to get transfused. A hematocrit in a very elderly ill person with heart disease, in other words, a hematocrit that's very low in the elderly, needs to be transfused if it's very low, and very low means less than 25 to 30, because if you're elderly and have heart disease, you may infarct as your first symptom. So if you're a 70-year-old guy who's got coronary disease, even if they're asymptomatic, you can't let them walk out of the hospital with a hematocrit at 24, they're going to infarct. Fix it. So you transfuse patients when they're symptomatic of anemia. Well, what does symptomatic mean? It means you're short of breath. It means you're lightheaded or confused. Or sometimes you have syncope. Or it means you have low blood pressure or tachycardia. Or you have chest pain. Now, the tachycardia is the hardest one to relate to because you can have tachycardia for a lot of things. But if the person's only reason for tachycardia is anemia, well, you can't let people walk around having chest pain, and hypotension, tachycardia. And you don't have to have all of these to indicate a need for transfusion. All symptomatic patients have to be transfused. Remember, no transfusion. Fusion if the person's young and asymptomatic. They will make their own reticulocytes. 
give them time. There's no rush. They're asymptomatic and they'll get their own reticulocytes in a couple of days. Let's be 100% clear when each of the blood products is diffused. When you see someone talk about transfusion, transfusion of red cells means always pack cells. This is a concentrated form of blood. If you take whole blood, what a person donates, and remove the plasma, that's the pack cells. And that's why removing that plasma makes the hematocrit in the pack cells around 70 or 80. Now that means you gotta understand that that's why you can get such a big increase in the hematocrit with one or two units of pack cells. If you remove the plasma, it doubles the hematocrit, and each unit of pack cells raise the hematocrit by three points. Why is this important? A person comes in, they're bleeding. You transfuse two units of pack cells, and the hematocrit stays the same, or goes up by one point. Your hematocrit is 25. I gave you two units of cells. Your hematocrit goes to 26. Uh-oh! You're still bleeding. You're still bleeding. How come you only went up by one point? Now, if you don't know how much the hematocrit's supposed to go up with each unit of pack cells, how are you supposed to know whether the person's still bleeding? Hydration only lowers the hematocrit by two or three points. Maybe four. Based on body size, giving two, three liters of fluids can only make the hematocrit go down by three or four points tops. So if I give you two units and four units and your hematocrit stays the same, that's a big problem. It means you're still bleeding. Get scoped. Fresh frozen plasma is 150 mLs of plasma that we take out to make the pack cells. It replaces clotting factors. And you use it when there's an elevated prothrombin time, APTT, or INR. Most important, it is used when you're actively bleeding. We rarely use FFP if people are not bleeding because the clotting factors don't last for a bleed, last for a day or two. Some even less, last for hours. So if you have a person who's bleeding, who's got a coagulopathy, coagulopathy from high PT, PTT, or INR, you need to use those fresh frozen plasma clotting factors to stop the bleeding. Fresh frozen plasma is also used as replacement with plasmapheresis, sometimes called plasma exchange. So FFP, though, doesn't give you hemophilia A or B factor. It doesn't give you factor 8 or factor 9. Hemophilia A factor is factor 8. Hemophilia B factor is factor 9. It doesn't work with von Willebrands because those factors are not put into fresh frozen plasma. If you go to give a unit of blood, I can't give. You can't give when you donate. When you donate, you cannot donate factor 8, factor 9, or von Willebrands factor. Why not? I'm giving you my blood. How come you can't take it? Because a normal person, where is the factor 8 and 9? It's under the endothelial cells, lining the blood vessels. So I can't donate factor 8 and 9 because it's stored beneath those endothelial cells. So therefore, you have to give people desmopressin for those factors to help them release their own or give them recombinant versions of factor 8 and factor 9. Fresh frozen plasma is the standard for people who are having acute bleeding and an elevated PT-PTT except for those with hemophilia or von Willebrands. Cryoprecipitate is a pooled blood product. It's used to replace fibrinogen. It has some utility in disseminated intravascular coagulation and DIC. We rarely use it anymore, and it's never first for anything. It provides a high amount of clotting factor in a small volume. It won't collect factor 8, 9, or von Willebrand's factor because you can't donate it. It's like taking all the clotting factors in FFP and you scoop out almost all the clotting factors, like 50 or 60% of the clotting factors, but if you freeze it, it actually is like making butter. You can skim the clotting factors off in where you get 50% of the clotting factors in 10% of the volume. 50% of the clotting factors in 10% of the volume. And you never use it first for anything, and neither do you use whole blood for anything. Whole blood is absolutely never correct. Zero right answers. Whole blood is divided either into pack cells or FFP. So cryoprecipitate may never be used first, but if you have a person who's really bleeding out from DIC, we can use it if the FFP doesn't work. Whole blood, on the other hand, is easy for you as a question on step two. It's easy because it's never right.